good morning and also uh, good afternoon to colleagues in uh, Brussels and Kiev. And we also have a number of people who are listening in as well, uh, watching live stream. So welcome. Um, my name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund. I also serve as the co-chair of the Friends of Ukraine Network's Democracy and Civil Society uh, Task Force. Uh, here's my other uh, co-chair as well, Orist, and speaking a little bit as well. Um, I think, if, as many of you know, a little over a month and a half ago, we launched the Transatlantic Task Force on Elections and Civil Society in Ukraine with partners both in Ukraine and Brussels, uh, including the reanimation package reforms, uh, which has been a, a stellar partner in, uh, over the last uh, month and a half, actually two months, pulling this together. This is the third event of the task force in that period, so we've been quite busy at trying to uh, inject, I think, uh, new topics, but critical, timely topics, uh, not only impacting Ukraine, but also transatlantic relationship with Ukraine. And so, our, as I've mentioned early on, the goals of the task force is to better institutionalize the engagement of civil society in Ukraine with the U.S. and European uh, policymakers, opinion makers, think tanks, uh, and civil society organizations that are focused on Ukraine and focused on Ukraine's transatlantic integration and democracy. Um, one of the gaps that, that we saw early on that existed in forming this effort was one of a communication gap between Kiev and Washington, Kiev and Brussels, and actually at times uh, communication gaps between Brussels and Washington as it relates to, to Ukraine and the region. And I think the events over the last two weeks in particular have highlighted these challenges, particularly in the Black Sea and Kerch Strait. Um, I know, Elena, you're going to talk in Brussels about what you've seen in terms of the response uh, to what's taken place uh, both here in Washington um, from letters of resolutions. But I can say that I think there's a heightened uh, focus. Uh, we hope that that focus is also reaching policymakers uh, in the government as well, in the U.S. government and in the EU as well, which is critical. And we're also obviously watching very closely issues such as uh, Russian military buildup uh, in the East as well, which is uh, obviously disconcerting. And there are others in this room here today who have uh, spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks focused on sort of what the U.S. response should be from sanctions to uh, to what NATO should be doing. So we welcome their, their thoughts and weighing in. But today's uh, meeting is really a special meeting of the task force because we're on the eve of the uh, campaign for president in Ukraine. At the end of this month on the 31st, uh, Ukrainian presidential elections will kick off. Um, we know that there's a number of names out there floated out there that are likely to be running. Um, I have Steve uh, Nix here with IRI, who's also been following this and tracking it closely, uh, looking at polling data and information. Uh, but we know it's going to be a contentious election in Ukraine, but also one that has quite consequential uh, based on who is elected in Ukraine. Uh, which will not only have an impact on sort of UK, Ukraine's trajectory internally, but also its relationship with partners like the United States and the EU. So I'm pleased really today to recognize a really distinguished panel. Uh, one of our panelists, unfortunately, uh, Kitty Fox, is, is not feeling well, is not able to participate today. Um, but I would all, and I know, Oris, you, you will discuss this too, but... Um, um, I think Ambassador Taylor, you were part of that as well. I won't put you on the spot, but I would uh, really direct everybody to you know to look at that. Uh, I think really well done assessment that uh, laid out several important recommendations. In fact, echoing some of the recommendations that RPR and Ukrainian civil society laid out several months ago. And so you know, uh, although Katie's not here, and I know there will be other opportunities to engage uh, with NDI on the report, um, I would just draw your attention to the report, those recommendations. And I think the most important part is recommendations are meant to be um, fulfilled. They're not just recommendations for recommendations sake. Um, they're laying out some of the <coughs> needs of the election to ensure that this is a free, fair and transparent election um, and that it strengthens Ukraine's democracy. And I think that for this group uh, that's here and there's a lot of uh, distinguished uh, participants around this table in Washington, Brussels, and Kiev. Um, nothing is more important than to see this election move forward in the right manner. With that said, if I could just 
um, turn it over to uh, my co-chair Oris uh, just for an opening you know, remarks. And then what we'll do is um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction of, of the participants, uh, speakers today. And, and then we'll start here in Washington, uh, move over to uh, uh, Kiev, and then we'll move over to Brussels. And I also I just want to uh, ask for everybody's patience as well. I know it's challenging to sit through a lot of presentations, uh, but we appreciate that. And then we'll, have, we'll open up the floor to opportunities for Q&A, both in Washington, Brussels, and if there are any in Kiev as well. We would be happy to take those. So if I could turn, Oris, can I turn it over to you now? Sure. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. In fact, you ended up saying a lot of what I was going to say. But that's great. You know, if we didn't quarter, we think alike. That may be dangerous. So, OK. Um, so I just want to add a little to your description of the Friends of Ukraine Network, Democracy and Civil Society, which we co-chair, and which, by the way, Steve Nix is a member of, as well as was several other people around the table. Uh, Ambassador Taylor being one. And um, uh, what I, I do want to mention that that's an initiative of the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation. I also want to mention um, that if you were not able to attend our first two public events, uh, my U.S.-Ukraine Foundation colleague to the right, Adrian Karmazin, has written two excellent articles uh, about those events, which are on the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation website. I also want to take this opportunity to um, thank the German Marshall Fund, because these Tri-City events simply would not be possible without their support. So uh, they're essential as their partner. And I want to thank you, including uh, Jonathan, and as well as John Alexander, who's, who's uh, really <laughs> staff, incredibly Last Saturday, December 15th, was a historic day with the creation of an independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church. This, this is a truly consequential event with implications well beyond the religious. Not that the religious aspect is unimportant, but it's about identity. It's about history. It's about decolonization. It's about geopolitics. It's a major blow to the concept of a Ruske Mir, Russian world and to Russian imperialism, which has left so much destruction and misery in its wake. So what are the implications of this momentous event on election race itself? Will it translate to increased support for the incumbent? Um, there are other questions as well, which maybe our speakers will address. What are the prospects for the more blatantly Russia-friendly uh, candidates, uh, you know, the so-called opposition bloc? remnants of the region. Also, will there be a serious alternative to either Poroshenko or Poroshenko coming from the reformist bloc? That seems to be an open question um, still. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers on these and other election-related matters. Lastly, in addition to the political context and environment, as Jonathan indicated, the conduct of the election matters. To this end, I do commend to your attention that NBI and EP pre-election assessment report. Uh, it truly is detailed, and it's very, very good. It kind of reminds me of some of the OSCE uh, pre-election assessment reports, but the OSCE um, will only be doing that probably in the coming months. They, they won't really be on the ground in serious way for another probably about a month. So bottom line is we all need to help Ukraine ensure a free, fair, open uh, election process that will meet international standards and reinforce Ukraine's progress. Thank you. And uh, I just want to you know, also to join you in thanking, uh, I want to thank my colleagues also in Brussels uh, for, you know, Cynthia and Bruno for leading this. And Bruno, I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to, to add uh, in Brussels. Okay, I see a head nod now. Uh, we'll chip in when uh, we, we come in later in the show. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, but also I wanted to uh, turn to uh, also just for a quick, uh, just uh, hello to Elena in Kiev, who's been, um, I don't think we could have had a better partner over the last couple of months um, working tirelessly to make sure that, that, we're, that things work out on both ends. 
So, Alain, I don't know if you have any opening comments to, to thank, you, John thank you, Jonathan, dear colleagues in Kiev, Washington, and Brussels. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today for this third meeting of the Transatlantic Task Force on Elections and Civil Society in Ukraine. Uh, here in Kiev, we have a mainly diplomatic audience today, including representatives of the EU delegation to Ukraine, uh, USAID office, NATO representation, Embassy of Germany, Great Britain, Estonia, Poland, um, Hungary, and other missions. Uh, we also have uh, journalists here, and I would like to thank our partners in, in Washington and Brussels for uh, putting this event together and for closely following the developments around Ukraine, and we really appreciate this opportunity to discuss uh, the different perspectives uh, on Ukraine's upcoming elections from the perspectives of the three uh, capitals. Um, and um, I, I'll, I'll continue further after the, the first presentation, but um, thank you very much again, and back to Washington now. Thank you. And, and I just want to point out, Elena, on your end too, I know, I think we have, I don't know how many uh, partners, uh, uh, several partners as well on the ground. Uh, Ukraine Crisis uh, Media Center, which has been hosting this as well, and want to thank them uh, for yeah. for their for their support. We have over 10 um, key think tanks and NGOs that joined this initiative from Kiev, and uh, and thank you very much again to Ukraine Crisis Media Center for hosting us as well. Thank you. So I'm not going to do. Uh, I know all the bios were included in the um, in the. Uh, 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 invitations that went out, so I won't go quick. I won't go through them completely, uh, but I would want to just point out um, uh, to my left is Steve Nix, who is uh, who is one of the leads, um, as we know, uh, particularly on, Eur on Eurasia at IRI, and has been for a number of years. Um, you're the director for Eurasia, which covers a number of countries, including Ukraine, across the region. You've been. Uh, uh, working with IRI, but also at USAID. Um, you are also a lawyer, which you've told me recently as well, which is a displaced lawyer. Uh, but we're glad that you've been displaced to work on Ukraine because you've been one of the leading voices uh, supporting Ukraine's democracy. Uh, and so we're really pleased to have you here today. Um, in Kiev as well, um, we have uh, Svetlana Kobza, who's a, uh, excuse me, I Irina. Uh, Bekeshkina. Bekeshkina, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the director of Democratic Initiatives Foundation, um, which is one of Ukraine's uh, uh, most important think tanks, leading think tanks, who's going to be weighing in on uh, sort of uh, Ukraine uh, coming into this election season as well. Uh, Svetlana Kobzar, who's with the European Endowment for Democracy, uh, focused on uh, Ukraine and the region in Georgia. Also a uh, professor as well, uh, distinguished professor. Uh, we're really pleased that you could join us uh, in Brussels as well. And we look forward to hearing from you. And I think it's particularly important, as many of you know, the role of the, the EU uh, with respect to Ukraine uh, because of the association agreement, um, because of, uh, in, in some sense, the, the future of Ukraine, as many of us around this table think about it, lies with uh, further integration with the EU and that means fulfilling uh, EU obligations. And of course, uh, this means for macro financial assistance uh, to support for uh, administrative reform. Uh, the, the list goes on and on in terms of the importance of the EU. So we're really pleased that you could be here uh, to join us and maybe give your thoughts about the perspective uh, from Brussels uh, as it relates to the upcoming elections. And Boris mentioned before, uh, you know, we, we obviously don't know who will be elected, but what we do hope is that the next government, whoever it will be, will be committed to, uh, to the reform path uh, that's both necessary for Ukraine's democracy, but for uh, economic growth in its future. And the questions about whether or not the next government will be, whether it's a reform candidate or those that are less committed to reform, uh, matters greatly to policymakers in Washington and Brussels. With that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn to, to Steve next to start us off. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a few people in Washington who have your expertise and, and background and have worked uh, on Ukraine and have seen the ups and downs. Um, we always say that this election is the most consequential election in X country's history. But, but for Ukraine, especially after the Maidan, um, it seems that we've hit a point, uh, an inflection point 
uh, based on, and I'll, you can go to the polling numbers, but even in your own polling numbers, where the Ukrainian citizens are today and what they want, and then also what the leaders are delivering and what the expectations should be going into this election. So, Steve, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you again for having me and, and putting up with me for a second consecutive day. Yesterday, we were here to talk about the, the elections coming up in Moldova. Uh, but today, Ukraine, uh, greetings to our friends in Kiev and to Brussels. It's a great pleasure to join you here today. I'm just going to go quickly into numbers and without making any predictions, maybe provide some context of what we can expect in the upcoming presidential elections. Uh, I've given a number of presentations, let's say a month ago, uh, both to think tanks and on the Hill. And this presentation is quite a bit different because things have changed so dramatically in, in the last month. Uh, so I'll, I'll start first with a month ago, we were saying um, the election's wide open. It's still the case. The numbers strongly suggest that the race is wide open, and that uh, uh, the elections will result in a runoff, that pursuant to the data we currently have, uh, no candidate will receive 50% plus one, and there will be runoff uh, three weeks thereafter on April 21st. Uh, currently, the numbers that we have, and this is somewhat dated data, we're in the field right now with the polls, so we'll have some fresh data for you when you come back from the holidays. But uh, in the uh, ballot test shows the race is wide open. We have Tymoshenko in the lead among likely voters at 17, President Poroshenko at 10, Zelensky at 10, Hrytsenko at 9, Boyko at 8, Rabinovich at 5, uh, and so on and so on. Then you get into to, uh, single figures. So again, wide open race, 17% uh, undecided. And so a month ago, we were talking about these numbers and working with political parties and all the parties we were working with were devising strategies and tactical plans based not only on a runoff, but at that time, a matchup with a coalition of pro-Russian parties. And I've mentioned both of them. Zajitya, which we've seen go from zero to 7% in the last six months, and the uh, previously established uh, opposition bloc, both openly pro-Russian political parties. And a month ago, there was a lot of discussion and, in fact, announcements that there would be a coalition of these two parties. And together, their numbers would represent you know, a serious challenge to some of the other contenders in this election. So at that point in time, a lot of the parties were discussing what's the most favorable matchup in the second half. And obviously, the preferred matchup for President Poroshenko, for example, or Yuli Tymoshenko is a match up with the pro-Russian party. Because then the election, the election campaign is basically run on church, language, Donbass, Crimea, and it's an easy event. That's changed dramatically, as you all know, you're all careful Ukraine watchers. That coalition seems to have blown up. Uh, and we won't get into the reasons why, but it doesn't appear that, that will happen. So that's dramatically changed the way political parties and these candidates are viewing their strategies. Uh, now they're looking around at different scenarios for the second round. So uh, I would just go back to the data and say that uh, when we look at the 17% undecided, what we did was we cross-referenced likely voters, people who say and, and will very likely go to turn out to vote uh, with um, uh, likely voters and um, uh, people who are undecided about their choice. Okay, so this is a vote that's going to be cast. We're not sure who they're going to cast for. When we looked at those people, who they are, where they are, very revealing. It shows us that overwhelming, you know, sixty some percent, these are women voters. Secondly, and equally important. Uh, these are voters in the West and in the center. So it suggests to us a couple of things. First of all, uh, the pro-Russian parties can't depend on additional votes from this group of people. Uh, they're just not there. Western Ukrainians are not going to vote for pro-Russian parties. And uh, the female votes very And this goes to the religious issue and, and what's changed. Uh, a month ago during these presentations, I was saying, Whichever candidate could 
persuasively argue to the Ukrainian people that they were best positioned to create jobs, move the economy, uh, resolve the situation in Donbass in a peaceful way, and curb corruption would be elected. But the, uh, the presentation or arrival of two new issues, which is the church issue, which Boris alluded to, and this uh, Zolsky Mori issue, I think is changing the dynamic and could have tremendous effect on the way the campaigns uh, are going to be managed. Back to this vote. So uh, women and Western Ukrainians are going to be the key deciders in this race, according to the current data. And of course, we'll match this up with the data that we get in the next poll. But one, one could suggest that uh, President Poroshenko would benefit because he's been so far up front uh, on the church issue. And again, I just want to take two minutes to discuss the church issue because Boris uh, stressed its importance. Uh, I can tell you that in meetings with members of Congress, it's difficult for Americans to understand the depth and importance of this issue, both to Ukraine and to the Russian Federation. <clears throat> Uh, the geopolitical element to it, as Boris said, is just as important as the religious element. Uh, Putin has failed in his military attempt to overtake and occupy what he describes as the most near. And the geographic area that Boris described in his opening statement basically says if Russian forces were to uh, fan out from, from uh, rostov Nadanu, take Mariupol, keep going to Odessa, and then hook up with the Russian 14th Army in Moldova and Transnistria. That area constitutes what Russia, what Putin has, has Rustamir, that geographic section of, of Ukraine. So he's failed militarily. And this presents a second, subsequent, and I think equally important failure, and that is continuing uh, Russian influence in churches in those areas. And so it's not only affects the geopolitical, but I think this is going to become a pressing issue because now that the decision has been made, uh, the 12,000 parishes that exist in Ukraine are going to have to choose whether they remain under uh, the jurisdiction of the, the Moscow Patriarch or want to join the new church. So this is going to take place in a, the next several months during the presidential campaign, and I think will be a big issue. Equally important, I think, in the campaign is going to be the Sea of Azov issue. Again, uh, in my view, the, uh, the, although he's been criticized politically, uh, the president had no choice but to take the steps that he did. Uh, it's arguable whether martial law was necessary, but as commander-in-chief, he's compelled by the Constitution of Ukraine to act decisively. And I would argue, and, and what I've said publicly in media interviews is, I was urging this administration, our European partner, to act as decisively as President Poroshenko has on this issue. Uh, and again, we've made the argument to increase sanctions, targeting sanctions, perhaps to target economic sanctions against uh, the Russian ports that would benefit in the event that the Ozovsky Mori is closed off to brought to by Ukrainian shipping, providing Ukraine with additional defensive weapons uh, and, and other types of assistance. So again, these are two issues that didn't appear a month ago on the radar and now I think are going to be prominent and I think are going to move these undecided numbers. Um, a couple of other things, because uh, I'll let, I want to hear from our uh, uh, Kiev folks. The, back to the numbers, again, um, the national numbers are not particularly good in terms of right track, wrong track. You've all seen this, we share this publicly. Again, you know, over 70% of Ukrainian people think the country's going in the wrong direction. But where we do see optimism, we do see reform, we do see change, is at the local level. Because our polling indicates that the vast majority of Americans support their mayors and city councils and indicate they see reform and change taking place in the local level. So in that case, the administration's decentralization uh, program is actually moving along and doing quite well. But that's where respond in surveys uh, in terms of indicating where they see change and, and more of a positive viewpoint in the direction of, of uh, their communities. So again, I, I think these these issues will come into play in the campaign as people pass their votes. Uh, we'll have more data for you. 
In the meantime, IRI has been very busy uh, in the last months preparing political parties and candidates, doing training in various aspects. Uh, and again, the, the polling data, which I'm sharing with you today, uh, is principally political. I mean, it's, it's great information for us to discuss and to have, but we have to remind ourselves it's the political parties that we because this helps them tremendously in terms of their messaging and particularly their bargaining. Where are my friendlies that I have to turn out? Where are the undecideds that I have to convince them for me? And where are the people and who are the people that will never support our party or our candidates so we don't spend valuable resources on them? So again, I think the data plays a, a particularly uh, important role in this. Uh, we'll meet again, I hope, so we can do a presentation on uh, the next round of survey data, which I, you know, as we get closer to the elections, we we're going to see that 17%, see where they are going, where they're heading, and see if, if other candidates are picking up support. And again, there may be new candidates in the field. Um, uh, there are some celebrities that have indicated, you all know their names, um, the possibility of entering the election, that could provide a new dynamic. But the bottom line is, this election is wide open. Uh, we're going to a runoff, and we'll be watching very closely to see how voters make up their minds. And again, the, the final reminder in the polling data is given the fact that uh, uh, Ukraine has a mixed system. Again, this goes to, this gives us a preview of what happens in the party list. Uh, we can't really project, and, and our, our friends from the Democratic Initiatives Organization can can, uh, can can weigh in on this, but doesn't give us an exact picture of what's going to take place in single mandate districts. That's my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions after we hear from, from our other. Steve, thank you. Um, and I think, uh, I'm glad you pointed out parliamentary elections. Obviously, this is the presidential elections is about to kick off, but we have a whole, you know, it seems like a, a year of politics in, uh, in Ukraine. And when the task force set, up, set out and uh, started, uh, we were foc very much focused on the election uh, uh, cycle and that timeline uh, that we would work at, you know, up until that parliamentary election and then beyond. Uh, I did want to point out what you did uh, as well, which is the Sea of Azov. At our last uh, task force meeting, there was a great deal of focus on this as well as cybersecurity, uh, which is also critical as well in this role of Russia which I'm sure will be discussed here and, and continue to be discussed here, the role of Russia in these elections and uh, disinformation interference as well. And I think it's important to tie that in. I could just spin off of the comments on parliament. I, I wanted to bring into focus the parliamentary elections because this goes back to pro-Russian parties. Uh, again, the, the, uh, our view is uh, the intention, the goal of uh, authorities in the Kremlin is to ensure that a Russian-friendly government is elected in Ukraine. And so this coalition presented a real opportunity uh, to try to do that, at least in the presidential elections. That seemingly has failed. But again, looking forward to uh, parliamentary elections, you know, given the threshold in Ukraine, right now both of these pro-Russian numbers would continue, uh, might possibly enter the parliament. So it is possible that there will be a pro-element, pro-Russian <coughs> present in the Verkhovna Rada uh, next year, and Ukraine is going to have to contend with that. That's definitely right. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Kiev. Elena, what, Elena, you want to pick it up from here with Irina as well. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I would like to start with saying thank you to NDI and IRI for their comprehensive studies of Ukraine's pre-electoral situation. This is obviously extremely important um, for the understanding of how Ukraine's elections are perceived in the West. Um, I would say that in the last few weeks since we held our previous uh, task force event, Ukraine has remained very high on the agendas of its key international partners, and uh, I would like to briefly touch upon some of the international reactions to Ukraine's developments. Uh, first of all, the European Parliament um, adopted a resolution calling uh, for increased EU sanctions against Russia if 24 Ukrainian sailors captured in the Black Sea were not um, released, and also called on the OSCE uh, to extend the mandate uh, of the special monitoring mission in the uh, in Ukraine uh, to the Azov region. 
uh, EU member states uh, in response unanimously prolonged uh, sanctions against Russia given zero progress in the implementation of Minsk agreements. Um, U.S. House of Representatives uh, approved three resolutions on Ukraine uh, condemning uh, Russia's military aggression against <coughs> Ukraine, um, opposing the completion of the construction of the Russian uh, pipeline Nord Stream 2 and um, um, commemorating the, six, uh, the 85th anniversary of Holodomor in Ukraine. Uh, also, NATO Secretary General uh, Jan Stoltenberg stated that NATO uh, will supply Ukraine Ukraine's military with secure communication equipment as soon as this month. Uh, there was also a statement uh, by the UN General Assembly, um, a resolution uh, adopted by the US UN General Assembly saying that um, calling on Russia to immediately withdraw its troops from Crimea and to end its occupation of Ukraine's territory. Uh, moreover, the UN resolution uh, mentions that by occupying Crimea, Russia is uh, violating the Budapest Memorandum of uh, 1994. Uh, also, U.S., Canada, and other partners welcomed the establishment of uh, uh, the Unified Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which was mentioned before, and we fully agree that this is an important step, a very important step uh, in not only receiving autonomy for Ukrainian church, but also in strengthening Ukraine's uh, independence. Uh, there was also another, resolu another important statement coming from the EU, uh, and this time it's on the local developments. It was by the head of the European diplomacy, Federica Mogherini, who touched upon the issue of the local elections in Ukraine. She said that uh, the local elections must take place despite the state of martial law imposed in 10 regions of Ukraine. And this brings us back to the domestic um, policy, domestic developments, and to Ukraine's upcoming elections. Next week, um, on December 23rd, Ukraine will hold elections in a number of regions in the unified local communities as a part of the decentralization process. Uh, but as far as we know as of now, and we don't think that this is going to change because uh, it's just a few days. From now, uh, elections will not be held in the 10 regions where the martial law is in place until December 26. Uh, so uh, 52 communities out of 151 communities will not hold their elections this time, and the, 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 the date of the elections is not um, identified as of now. And also, as was mentioned before, in less than two weeks, um, the um, official start of the presidential race um, is going to, to, to come, and this remains the most unpredictable campaign by far uh, since Ukraine's independence. Um, so to, to shed some light on the on the campaign itself, on the public on the public expectations in this regard, and on on how Ukrainians see the progress of Ukraine's reforms in this pre-election year, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Irina Bekeshkina, director of um, Democratic Initiative Foundation. First of all, I'd like to, uh, to apologize that I'll uh, speak Ukrainian. Unfortunately, my English is too far from being perfect, and I'm afraid that maybe sometimes I could not find the necessary word uh, to express uh, rightly my thoughts uh, and uh, views. Uh, ну, щоб говорити, якими будуть вибори, очевидно, треба дуже коротко. Well, speaking about the prospects of Ukrainian uh, elections, uh, one needs to characterize, first of all, the Ukrainian society itself at present. Uh, the situation is uh, the following. Uh, the, our foreign experts uh, appreciate much higher the Ukrainian reforms than the Ukrainian experts do. And uh, I agree with the point of view expressed by many of our colleagues that after Revolutsia uh, Hidnosti, a lot uh, has been done uh, that was worthy and uh, appreciable. And uh, I would like to refer uh, you to the words of Mr. Uh, Mingarelli, who uh, appreciated uh, significantly, greatly, uh, the achievements in Ukraine. Uh, among these achievements are the formation of uh, the uh, capable armed forces.
It it was the same uh, with uh, with English here in Kiev with the English uh, sounded English. Uh, we barely heard you, but uh, we were doing our best. No, we've heard everything, but uh, the the sound was you know just uh, up up and down, up and down all the time. Hello, one, two, three, can you hear us? Well, to continue, uh, it is obvious that that uh, uh, association agreement with the European Union uh, uh, and as well as this uh, reception of the Thomas, uh, the uh, autocephalous status uh, for uh, the church, uh, uh, the uh, inaction of a number of anti-corruption laws, uh, the decentralization reform, all of these things have been uh, real achievements. And uh, uh, we are glad to say that uh, if we use this five, uh, five points uh, uh, range, uh, the three is at least uh, well deserved, uh, the three uh, points level. Why uh, then the Ukrainian experts are that pessimistic? Well, because of the three uh, uh, aspects, uh, like uh, first uh, the uh, hostilities uh, in the Donbass, then uh, it's a very bad economic situation, uh, lowering uh, incomes, uh, and then uh, the third one is corruption. Everybody points out uh, these three uh, aspects among uh, the others. Uh, well, uh, we uh, object uh, by saying that it's not the Ukrainian government who is capable of uh, uh, stopping these skirmishes in the east, uh, and uh, uh, the pro-Russian forces uh, have been actively, you know, uh, paddling that situation. Uh, uh, the economic situation has been deteriorating, indeed, uh, especially in the last two years. Uh, but uh, the Statistics Bureau uh, uh, says uh, that uh, the average uh, provision uh, level uh, uh, is at least 80% uh, of what uh, it was in 2014. So uh, we can say that uh, there was some uh, Recovery. There has been some recovery, but uh, uh, not. It's not yet satisfactory, and uh, certainly that uh, uh, you know has its uh, uh, that is imprinted in in the uh, emotions and attitudes of uh, the uh, citizenry in Ukraine. Eighty percent, more than eighty percent, of whom uh, negatively assess economic situation in the country. Um, speaking about corruption, it's well only only too uh, well uh, known. Only eight percent of the population of the respondents that whom we surveyed uh, considered that uh, the anti-corruption efforts positive and sufficient. More than eighty percent considered them insufficient. Every day in the newspapers, on TV, uh, case after case after case of corruption uh, is. Uh, uh, you know, is is presented, and uh, for example, uh, this uh, diamond prosecutor's uh, uh, case uh, that has been uh, going on for five years uh, has not yet been completed. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, so in the society there is uh, this quite negative, uh, uh, cumulative attitude uh, uh, that. Uh, approaches this state of depression uh, for many people. Uh, so if we uh, recall this uh, uh, orange uh, revolution, uh, uh, um, then uh, after some time of Mr. Yushchenko's activities, uh, the disappointment was also uh, growing. But then uh, it was translated into uh, 
uh, high percentage points for two uh, other politicians, for uh, uh, Mr. Yanukovych and Ms. Uh, Timoshenko. And uh, there were, these became uh, basically two clearly uh, visible leaders. Uh, but uh, Ms. Timoshenko uh, was unfortunate in uh, as far as she was a premier after that, uh, or at the time of uh, the uh, world financial crisis of 2008. Uh, Mr. Yanukovych thus uh, won uh, the next elections. The situation today is, as uh, I have already uh, told you, is quite depressed, quite pessimistic. And uh, uh, these events uh, of uh, the Orange Revolution and uh, the lack of, uh, you know, growth, strong growth and uh, other positive developments, uh, it brought about this, uh, you know, quite depressed uh, uh, attitude and lack of faith and trust. Practically, uh, all institutions, uh, starting from the government and the presidency, uh, are not considered trustworthy by the citizenry. Uh, the army is the only, the armed forces is the only institution that has still enjoys some some repute. Uh, if we look at the uh, recent. Uh, results uh, in December, uh, uh, taken in December, the polls taken in December, uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, Ms. Timoshenko is a clear uh, leader. I haven't uh, mentioned the church uh, because uh, the church is uh, separated from the state and uh, it's not a uh, state institution, the not governmental institution. Uh, the volunteer organizations, some NGOs enjoy uh, some, some uh, trust. Uh, speaking about the politicians, Ms. Timoshenko is a clear uh, leader, uh, and uh, but in terms of uh, the overall percentage of uh, the population uh, who are uh, who express their uh, intention to vote for her, uh, it amounted to only 12 percent. Uh, Mr. Zelensky uh, is 8 percent had 8% according to those polls. And then uh, Mr. Poroshenko, Mr. Boyko, uh, Mr. Gritsenko and Mr. Deshko followed with practically the same uh, figures. Mm, I can tell you that uh, uh, this uh, pro vote is going to be uh, the protest vote. And uh, one important, uh, or another important factor is the role of the youth. The young people are quite uh, skeptical. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Zelensky, for example, has 17% uh, uh, among uh, the young uh, people. And uh, so I'd say that his candidacy in itself is an expression of this protest vote. Uh, I'm not at all sure that uh, uh, his uh, party would uh, participate in parliamentary elections in order to get Mr. Kolomoisky uh, uh, and his interests uh, represented in parliament. Uh, I'm not sure that it can uh, have any effect on uh, the presidential uh, elections. As a sociologist uh, who uh, uh, has uh, practically uh, taken part uh, in all uh, uh, presidential and parliamentary elections, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the uh, upcoming election campaign seems to be the most uh, unpredictable and unclear uh, as of uh, now. We uh, cannot even determine uh, the number of people and specific candidates uh, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, runoff. Uh, we uh, envisage, though, that the uh, number, the total number of the candidates uh, will uh, be in excess of 30 persons. And, uh, but if uh, the difference between different candidates is uh, uh, within the range of one percentage point, uh, you can uh, imagine how difficult it is to, um, uh, to, to make any, uh, any forecasts. So it becomes very important to win at least one percentage point from your uh, you know, competitor. And uh, uh, in some cases, as we know from our previous uh, elections experiences, uh, it would be easier to pay two million and a half uh, uh, hryvnias uh, and get, uh, you know, 
some of the candidates uh, uh, either removed or added to one's uh, war chest, so to say. Um, therefore, it's quite difficult for us now to uh, make any prognostications, any forecasts uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the outcome. Uh, but uh, uh, we uh, clearly see uh, the uh, present-day situation, the current situation in the country and its uh, impact on uh, the attitudes uh, of uh, the electorate. Basically, a lot of people still hope that there would be some uh, somebody, some uh, uh, you know, somebody with a magic wand uh, who would just uh, you know, with the snap of, a fing of, of his fingers, uh, you know, will uh, make miracles. Uh, and some of the candidates started already playing uh, that uh, exactly that tune. Uh, for example, uh, uh, trying uh, to or promising uh, uh, to reduce the tariffs uh, twofold, two times, uh, some uh, four times uh, the, uh, the 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 rates for the uh, for the utility services. That is, um, the candidate who is uh, who. Uh, uh, the, the candidates who make these uh, promises uh, obviously uh, would hardly be able to ever implement these promises. But as uh, you know, electoral promises are not something legally binding. Uh, we have uh, uh, what uh, we have. Um, so that was the first, uh, so to say, uh, threat. Uh, the second one is uh, are the. Uh, the attempts to bribe the uh, the uh, uh, voters. Uh, this process has already started when the pensioners uh, started uh, being addressed, uh, approached by uh, the members of uh, uh, staff of uh, electoral campaigns of different candidates. Uh, they are offered some uh, product packages, uh, sort of rations. Uh, and the third uh, 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 is, uh, in my view, a, a, an option that uh, the Russian Federation might uh, exert its influence uh, uh, and uh, they uh, might try to um, somehow discredit uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the candidates, except for maybe Mr. Boyko. Uh, uh, and uh, then there could be some financial uh, influences. For me, uh, it is not clear who uh, can finance, for example, uh, Mr. Boyko's uh, campaign. Uh, it could be uh, in the past uh, Mr. Ahmedov. Uh, uh, these days it could be uh, Mr. Firtas, some people say. But uh, as far as I know, his financial situation is uh, far from ideal. and. Uh, uh, another uh, aspect is uh, that uh, there could be direct provocations staged by some uh, candidates or uh, uh, by the Russian Federation uh, so that the blame uh, could be put uh, uh, brought to the door of the president in order to lower his uh, uh, his uh, ratings, uh, and Mr. Poroshenko is uh, the first among such people. Uh, what could we do in order to unite uh, our civil society, uh, our citizenry, in order to change uh, the nature of this electoral uh, campaign to reduce the level of populism? I think that the intelligent people should unite. Uh, uh, they, sh the analysts, uh, they should start asking uh, difficult questions, uh, uh, ask the candidates difficult questions, analyze uh, uh, the proposals that the candidates uh, make, their programs, uh, and inform the public so that the public can understand uh, where uh, they are deceived by the candidates. Um, 
that's how it's done, at least uh, in the other countries, uh, when uh, the uh, election campaigns are uh, organized. Uh, and uh, we know uh, the role of the exit polls uh, in uh, different uh, countries. Uh, in our country, it, it might be as important. Uh, uh, by the way, 69% of the voters uh, or, or of those surveyed uh, uh, said that they uh, didn't believe uh, in uh, the uh, fairness of uh, the elections, that the, the results of the elections would be uh, decent and fair. Uh, so that's my brief uh, overview of uh, the present day situation on the eve of the election campaign. Well, obviously, uh, uh, what we can do is uh, to monitor, to support uh, the NGOs and uh, analytical centers, the think tanks, uh, that are going to be constructive, playing a constructive role at uh, these elections. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, gentlemen in Washington. Thank you. Yes, apologies for these uh, technical difficulties. We are back to Washington now for your comments and questions. Great. Uh, I just want to thank you for that comprehensive um, uh, you know, background information. I think you covered a lot of ground in terms of both uh, the potential for Russian, uh, Russian, uh, the impact of Russia within the elections. Um, also, I think the uh, the issue of corruption um, and sort of going through, I think, a bit of a, a little bit of the history and timeline. I mentioned when I was talking about Steve having been quite involved in Ukraine for so many years, uh, the lack of trust um, in uh, institutions um, and sort of and concerns that that people are not seeing their lives bettered um, over the last uh, four years. And of course, uh, you know, Ukraine received a, um, a couple of different shocks in 2014. One was a was a massive economic shock that for most countries would have um, have uh, been catastrophic. Um, so, um, even though uh, the economy stabilized, um, I think the challenge is still there to see growth in uh, people's lives to, to be better. But thank you for going through that, through some of the candidates as well. Um, and I think uh, talking about uh, the role of youth um, and, and how they may uh, play a more significant role. Uh, but everything you said alludes to the fact that this is such an unpredictable election. Um, and, you know, I am 100 percent certain there are going to be a curveballs or new issues that are going to arise over the over the next couple of months that we're not even anticipating. Um, and that means that it's uh, for Washington and Brussels. Uh, it's uh, an election to watch. Uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Bruno and, and Brussels. And again, thank you so much for uh, my GF, GMF colleagues uh, for hosting. Uh, Bruno, uh, any thoughts on your end? And then also, um, if you could, uh, we could turn it over to our speaker there. And thank you again. Uh, well, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you to colleagues in Kiev as well. Very pleased indeed to have that uh, transatlantic gathering today, the miracles of technology. Um, as you can see, we are here together with a small but definitely dedicated group of people uh, here in Brussels. Uh, I would say that this town uh, is, for many obvious reasons, closely following developments in Ukraine. Uh, think, for instance, about society, uh, where the EU is heavily engaged in reform and good governance. Uh, but I also think that there's also business issues, for instance, that this city is following closely. Think about the unbundling of NAFTA gas, which is definitely going to come up as a big theme in January 2019 here as well. And obviously, the topic of our discussion today. Um, elections, uh, both presidential, but also um, parliamentary uh, later in 2019. I think what this city really hopes for, uh, if I may be free to say so, is continuity. Um, I think that this town here, Brussels, is looking for continuity, not only from a EU perspective, but also NATO perspective. Let's not forget that Brussels is also the seat of NATO headquarters. 
Um, and also, perhaps something to think of is the fact that the European Union will have its own elections. So there will be a new team at the European Commission, a new parliament, so that also may be a factor in future relations. But uh, that is it for me here. Um, I am actually sitting, sitting next to the stellar Professor <laughs> Svetlana Kopsar, who can uh, elaborate about these issues far better than I do. You are a uh, manager, a program manager at the European Endowment for Democracy. Uh, an organization that is doing many good things uh, in Ukraine, but also the wider region in Eastern Europe. So Svetlana, if you could perhaps um, share with us your straightforward thoughts, yep. uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno, for this generous introduction. And um, hello to Washington and Kiev. And we are... can you hear us well? Uh, yes, great. So I will continue. <laughs> I will, I will actually elaborate on some of the points that already were mentioned, um, and we have a lot of data already presented, which will be interesting for us to dissect and also see uh, how we make sense of it. I think for, for the European Endowment for Democracy, it's an interesting think, um, uh, angle at which we look at, since we are very much um, present in our work as support on the ground. So we have a, a most, uh, all of our support goes to the countries that we work in, and, and therefore we are very much looking at the domestic situation. But at the same time, we are physically located in Brussels and, of course, take part in all of the discussions and see what are their concerns and, and how our work fits into the wider scenes with the EU and other institutions. Um, so as, as Bruno already alluded, uh, we are focusing today on the issues of presidential elections. But in Ukraine, and I also think here, we all, we all realize that it's, it's a kind of a three-package election. So we're talking about presidential election, but they actually they serve as very much a springboard for the parliamentary elections and ultimately also for the local elections. And with decentralization, these issues, of course, matter quite um, a lot. Uh, and at the same time, I, I think when we focus on, on data and, and issues that are coming up and changing very rapidly, at the same time, this analysis helps us to take a stock of where we are and where we came from from the previous election, since this is kind of a marker of what has happened during that time and where what is the mood now and what it means for the, for the future. And in this case, um, we recall already Maidan, uh, which I think already was in the introduction mentioned. It has a special meaning for the EU because the idea of the EU agreement was served as a trigger. But we also shouldn't forget that, that there, the struggle is still ongoing and the struggle is much deeper than, than the EU and, and agreement with the EU. The struggle is for independence. And it also was mentioned as this breaking the ties from post, uh, I think, colonial um, and mindset and building the true independent institutions and that war is still I think ongoing and that's important to keep in mind because it also sets the mood for the societal mood and the way things are perceived as, as were mentioned also earlier on. Uh, and if we recall also the, this post-Maidan scene, we remember that at that time, indeed, uh, President Poroshenko captured the national vote, um, and it, it was for different you know, reasons, and even he went on to say after just the fresh polls came out after the elections uh, that we can definitely say all of Ukraine has voted, and this is a national vote. As was already mentioned, this is not the situation we have now. Probably none of the candidates can uh, have this bold statement unless we do have some really unexpected candidates coming in and, and change the situation changing drastically. But the way we are um, speaking today in the context that we have, we don't have that unity that we've had. At the same time, after Maidan, we had a certain credit of trust from society, even uh, willingness to have suffering for their longer uh, term uh, uh, benefit. That is not there anymore, and there is a huge distrust, um, but also the pessimism. But that is not new for now. This this, this pessimism has been now for for some years, after uh, for some period after Maidan. So this is not drastically just pre-election uh, mood as as such. After Maidan, we had also a whole change up in the makeup of the parliament. We had completely new MPs who joined the scene. They were in minority and they're still in minority. We don't have a new parliament after that. But they did make a change uh, where there's, there's a new sense of, of debates, um, of amendments to the laws, which are numerous, of the uh, complexity and also publicity of what is happening in the parliament and also of our own understanding that is happening in Brussels and Washington of what's actually happening in some of these discussions um, that you know normally happen behind the black, kind of the black in the black box. 
So even that minority of, of actors who came from civil society who had that credit of trust, they were also kind of a change breakers in that system for that moment of time. Now, of course, they confront difficulty. It's sort of like uh, in the EU, there's this capability expectation gap. A lot is expected and not many capabilities are there to deliver. So it is with these kind of agents of change, let's say, who made it. A lot of society has expected of them, but also not a lot of resources uh, that were there for them to really deliver. They didn't, they haven't had a majority, they haven't had all of the resources, and they're not the ones who, who control or have vested resources in the system. Therefore, it's also uh, understandable how the trust of society is not there uh, as much as it was after, after Maidan. It was already mentioned that uh, there's a lot of um, unpredictability in the elections, but I would argue that this is actually one of the gains that Ukrainians have earned as part of these elections. In fact, unpredictability is, is at the cornerstone of democratic process. Uh, it's very uncomfortable for analysts, for, for human beings, but this is something I think that we should be celebrated in the context of Ukraine. We don't know who will, who, who will win and, 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 and what the situation will be even in just a few months' time. At the same time, what we can see that, that besides this unpredictability, as part of the normal uh, democratic process, there is also a sense of plurality. It's not yet at this um, purely democratic stage we would like to see, because one uh, aspect of pluralism is also pluralism of oligarchs. Uh, pluralism of oligarchs having influence on the media, which also skews the level playing field. Um, but I think having several oligarchs means that there is also uh, some way of them trying to counterbalance the situation, placing eggs in different baskets, and also watching what probably is going to happen for them. Because one aspect that we had uh, that brought Maidan in part was also this um, this pushback against having one family controlling everything. And we know also from regional experience, having one oligarch is also no good news or one um, a, a strong hand that controls a lot of resources. Here there is unpredictability as also there is uh, pluralism. And, but at the same time, the fact that media and all of the resources are in, in, in the hands of these vested interests uh, also makes the, the level playing field highly uneven. So even if someone, um, a lot of Ukrainians were talking about potential Macron appearing on the, on the horizon, even though now it's not maybe the most even ex exciting candidate to use as an example, but um, it would still be very difficult for any John Macron, whoever, to really enter that race without having access to major TV channels, without actually making any agreement with any of the oligarchs. There are those who will be probably trying, but, but it is a very uh, steep hill for them uh, to 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 apply just the basic efforts to get their message across to the electorate, which is a basic principles of any democracy, is still uh, very difficult. So we don't have a lot of time. What are the determining factors that I that kind of um, uh, we see as, as some of the ones that will influence elections? It will. It was already uh, noted that on some aspects society is more united than before. Uh, for instance, the issue of national identity, you know, the issue of church, even uh, a percentage of atheists have been supportive of the issue of church, even though it can also be, you know, there is two sides of every coin. And in this case, it can also be a device factor, depending how it will be, um, uh, how things will evolve. But overall, we can see uh, a national identity that has been uh, forming, uh, especially accelerating in, in these years uh, with, uh, with, with war ongoing as well. So that's... Um, um, that's that's an interesting thing to to watch. At the same time, we can see that um, elites are also split. You, we've noticed that there may be some coalition in you know different parties, but at the same time, even upper block split um, the, the 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 one side, and and also the the reformist and young and peace and lots of activists are also trying to figure out you know, what was the situation will be and how things will, will develop. This, of course, weakens their position of, let's say, pro-reform coalition. Um, but at the same time, we'll have to see how things will develop for them. That that will mean whether there will be a fragmented or united uh, united front and how things will, will uh, develop. Another issue is, as I mentioned in, in my introduction, we had a very um, strong position which Poroshenko uh, had uh, in, the, in, the, in the after Maidan election. 
in this case, we have a leading candidates, and already the, this, the, the sociology uh, is clear that we have some candidates who are leading, but they also have high anti-rating. And what it means is that, as we mentioned, it's likely to, that we will have a second round. And if we have a second round, it's likely that even a winning candidate may also have a, an element of anti-rating or the, the, the electorate will be divided. And as I mentioned, looking at it as a package going into the fall into parliamentary elections, it means that par parliament may also be fragmented as we may have different factor factions uh, competing and different narratives competing because uh, there is not going to be as probably a one strong unifying um, voice in that respect. So this is also to, to, for us to see. Um, but uh, I think the second factor to watch, and this is a very difficult thing to watch, so this is more for us to be aware than to watch, um, it is oligarchs. Um, because, of course, they have a strong say. Uh, on the one hand, um, I think that for, you know, for oligarchs, uh, they are much more poor than they were sometime before. And uh, if anybody would be thinking rationally in the situation, one could think that they can be also at some point on a list of extinction species with the economy, if the economy doesn't go in a good direction either. Uh, so, but it doesn't necessarily mean perhaps for them to think uh, rationally. This is just something that they may need to take into account. And for any oligarch, probably if there are several of them, it would make sense that there should be the same rules of the game, predictable rules of the game. Uh, we've seen that happen in, the, in countries where, in fact, there were um, wealth influencing politics. Um, and at some point, wealth and politics and business and politics um, di differentiated their, their influence and there were some uh, rules of the game established. We will see to what extent this is possible in Ukraine, but this would be the next stage where the oligarchs would indeed uh, start to step away or the candidates would enter the parliament without having um, been controlled and agreements in advance where they wouldn't have any independent power for them, for them to act. Uh, but as, as, as I think uh, was Mostovaya, the quite famous journalist uh, from Ukraine once said, uh, you know, behavior of oligarchs is different when they, on the, when they are on the horse or under the horse. Um, and of course, in a situation when the Yanukovych was in power, when you're under the horse and you know that somebody controls it, the family resources, then the interest may be such that maybe it's not such a good thing. Whereas, you know, if you feel like you may be on the horse, then of course, rules of the game for everybody may not be so appealing. So this is a bit more nuanced, but this is a factor that is there and it's a big elephant in the room that has an influence uh, on, on everything. The third, and I will finish soon, is of course, uh, the closest to our hearts, uh, civil society. This is the determining factor because in Ukraine, uh, I think uh, whether it's president uh, or also anybody, for foreign dignitaries know that any agreement that is there to be signed even by the leadership needs to, to have a buy-in from society. That's why, you know, in some cases, Minsk uh, is not a given or uh, when you negotiate it, you know that there has to be some buy-in from the society and any other agreement, there has to be some buy-in from Ukrainian society. Um, and what, and what we've seen is that after Maidan, there was a sense of a pause and uh, trepidation uh, and in the regions, especially uh, for some local elites who were, let's say, on other different sides of, uh, who were kind of watching what will be the situation and what will be the reaction from the authorities, from the newly elected authorities after Maidan and what they can expect. What we are seeing as a huge concern for us now is especially in the previous year, we've seen a big increase in, uh, in, in the violence against activists uh, in the regions. And what we are concerned linked to the elections, that everybody is so fixated on the elections, including the, the people in the, net, in the capital, uh, that it may give a sense of impunity at the local level for the local um, uh, elites who may just simply think that a sense of loyalty may trump you know, a sense uh, of uh, um, of responsibility, and that and that may feed into impunity. Just today, there was also a case of, of violence, and overall, over the past uh, year, we've collected about 50 or so case instances of violence against in activists, including the one that European Endowment for Democracy is supporting, uh, which is uh, which is a huge concern. The last uh, but very important factor: this is the war in the East. Uh, and this will be, we already mentioned it in the, in the beginning, the issue of war and the issue of church. 
But the war and the sense of security and insecurity can be interpreted in different ways and can have an influence in, in different directions. I think the recent discussion regarding the martial law has shown to the to the president that it's that the sense of security is insecurity is not so powerful as to trump uh, criticism of the discussions on the martial law. So in this case, when there was a proposal to have a martial law that would be a bit longer and extend for the entire territory of Ukraine, that, that proposal was pushed back by the parliament, by civil society, by others. And the ultimate proposal that was then voted on uh, was, was a different one that was originally put on the table for discussion. That means two things. That means that civil society is vigilant, means the parliament is an actor. That means that, that the parliament it takes it seriously, this, this role of, uh, of, of pushing through. Um, but at the same time, I think that the issue of security and perception of insecurity may also make um, some blind to the to the day to day needs of the people, as was already alluded in that people do feel, even though there may be reforms done, even though there may be progress on, on anti corruption efforts. But in the end of the day, when people open the fridge, it's that what stares back at them, speaks to them. And as somebody put like whether it would be called basal geopolitics, like sausage or geopolitics, will what will be speaking to, to some people will also have an influence um, on, on, on the election. So I think I will stop it at, at that point. Uh, and, and regarding just, just a comment on, on the previous presentation regarding the youth, I think the youth is an important uh, demographic to watch, but also is the patterns that the youth adopt, whether they will come to the polling station and, and how this will play in and what will be the dynamics between clicking on the likes on Facebook versus going and actually casting a vote. And I think that will also play play a role. Svetlana, so, so, uh, thank you very much for um, giving us a bird eye overview of the issues uh, at stake. I very much like what you said, and I agree with you that unpredictability is perhaps one of the beautiful benefits of an active democracy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, perhaps unpredictability should not be leading to disruption. And I think the question is how you, do you embrace and predictability while making sure that Ukraine remains on the same trajectory, and the trajectory of Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. I think that is definitely a fair question to ask, and this town, Brussels, definitely has expectations in this regard. Um, Jonathan, I know I have many different questions to ask, but uh, let me pass the word to you for uh, further comments, thoughts, and ideas. Great. And Svetlana, thank you for that. I think that sweeping assessment. And Bruno, I also want to just thank you too for highlighting uh, the what I think is really important, which is the role that that Brussels, both for NATO headquarters, for the EU, is playing as it relates to Ukraine's future, uh, the upcoming European Parliament. Um, I have questions too, which I'll ask maybe about um, you know the potential that that you could have an EU uh, come next year that maybe is a little bit different in terms of its approach to Ukraine uh, based on some of the internal challenges uh, that we see within the EU itself um, and what might come out of those elections. Uh, but also, just Svetlana, just, just your point, um, and I want to highlight this on civil society and the attacks on civil society. Um, at our first task force meeting, this was a highlight um, of what we discussed, our uh, concerns about uh, the investigations, what the government, Ukrainian government is doing to protect civil society uh, that's led not only to violence but death of, of some members of civil society um, it's a real deal issue um, and it shouldn't be uh, in the midst of the election uh, needs to be addressed um, and uh, and so for this task force this is always a central focal point is to make sure especially as uh, when politics get as tight as they do when you have insecurity um, and challenges in the east that that the internal aspects of issues such as civil society are addressed and that the government whatever government is in place um is protecting civil society and viewing civil society as a as a, as a partner so thank you for for raising that that issue i didn't want that to you know to go unmentioned on our end that there's a lot of uh, a lot of concern here in washington for a number of different places regarding this issue uh, if I could, I want to just maybe open up to some questions now, um, and I know that we'll, there'll be questions in Brussels and Washington. Uh, I had one quick question, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Oris for uh, for his uh, opening question. One was really uh, about martial law. Um, obviously, it's supposed to end 
I believe it's next week. Um, is there an expectation that it will be extended? What will be, what's the next step on that? And maybe Kiev can answer that question. Um, yeah, we have not heard any public information, public debate on this, and there is no clarity whether the martial law will be extended. As of now, it is supposed to end on uh, December 26, as expected. We'll be watching that closely. Oris, can I turn it to you for questions? Sure. And this will be a quick uh, question, more informational to allow others to, to explore topics. Uh, thank you also for your truly comprehensive overviews and uh, presentations. Um, quick question of Steve, but uh, Irina could pipe in on this and Svetlana too, is um, Steve talked about 17% undecided. We've all been talking about the unpredictability of these election, presidential elections. Of course, all of them in independent Ukraine's history have been competitive, but I agree this one looks to be the most unpredictable. 17% undecided. Granted, I think the poll was taken about four months out. Um, I, I'm just October, okay. So I'm just curious how that compares that number to previous elections. Um, so. I mean, 17% is not a surprising number at this point in the game. Uh, that's why we're, we're going back into the field one more time. And the difference in this poll is that, again, anticipating a runoff, uh, in addition to the, the traditional ballot test question, we will be testing various candidates in second round scenarios. So I think that'll give us a better idea of what people do, how they will act uh, uh, how they will vote during the during the uh, runoff, um, but I have a question about polling, if I if I may, for Pani Irina Yaksho Morshna, Yamaya Petanya Deyavas. You had to Yaksho. If I may uh, ask you, are you going to have something like national exit poll during uh, the elections? National Institute of Sociology conducted in uh, the last month, in December. Uh, it is 27% of undecided, because it was a very long uh, uh, list of candidates, included uh, 37 candidates, and people undecided uh, 20, uh, 27%, much more. And uh, very recently, we will have our own uh, survey, uh, that started uh, yesterday, just yesterday, uh, it uh, results uh, will be uh, up to the um, 20, uh, 28th of December. It is very important because all these events with uh, the uh, Ukrainian church, uh, we will see uh, the influence of such events on ratings. It's very important, I think. Uh, as to exit poll, it is very important because uh, at, at each uh, elections, uh, we conducted national exit poll uh, funded by international donors, and now uh, we suggested uh, the, um, our electoral uh, program of Democratic National uh, in, uh, Initiatives Foundation that uh, include exit poll. And uh, much more than exit poll, it's very important to have independent uh, uh, surveys uh, not dependent of uh, candidates, uh, uh, some kind of uh, service for different uh, uh, civil society organizations that work, that which uh, work at the elections, such as uh, Opora and uh, uh, KVU, uh, uh, KVU. Committee of, oh, yes, Committee of Voters of Ukraine and such as. Uh, what is the difference between our uh, electoral surveys and surveys for candidates? Because for us, this is the start of our campaign. For them, this is finished. They conduct a survey and it's all. And it's very important to conduct uh, independent of candidates uh, exit poll because I said that uh, 30 Nine percent of people not uh, believe in honestly of upcoming elections, and only 17 believe. Okay. 
All right. Uh, one other question. This is more informational, but it's a little bit telling that no one, uh, including us in our introductions, mentioned the electoral code in previous um, the new election law, uh, which obviously, if it was passed, could have uh, pretty significant implications on the conduct of elections if implemented. Um, the fact that we're not hearing about it, does that mean it's dead? What are you hearing? I did meet with a few RADA members who were in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and they seemed rather pessimistic. But I was wondering, especially for our Kiev folks, what are we hearing about it? Um, or is we're hearing the same thing, basically, and there's a pretty broad consensus among the national level and national partners in the civil society that uh, there is no hope that the electoral code will be um, adopted in the second reading before the presidential or parliamentary elections. So we are, um, um, we are left with the previous electoral system, basically, and we should focus on other um, uh, components of the electoral reform that are more realistic, like uh, strengthening the responsibility for election-related crimes, making sure that IDPs can vote, um, and, and other things like those. But the electoral code, um, where uh, the parliament is still, um, as far as we know, it's, it hasn't even reached the, the, the middle of the list of um, the 4,500 uh, amendments um, that were suggested to the code after the first reading. So. Um, we, we think this topic should be, unfortunately, put on hold. So we're going to open up uh, here to questions in Washington. We'll take a few here, and then we'll turn it over to to Brussels for, for them to also uh, ask a few questions. So we'll start here first. Um, Ambassador Birchbaum, I think we have a microphone. So please just identify yourself. Yeah. And Thanks very much. Uh, Sandy Birchbaum. Uh, from the Atlantic Council, formerly NATO Deputy Secretary General. Uh, uh, two questions. First, uh, Steve, uh, in his opening briefing, said that the uh, pro-Russian coalition had blown up. But I wonder if our colleagues in Kiev agree that uh, they're, they're finished, or whether they still have a strong spoiler role to play, or anti-Poroshenko role, uh, since Putin seems determined to uh, undermine Poroshenko and might stage some provocations even over Christmas. Uh, that we don't know. Uh, and of course, the Ru Russian interests are buying up uh, uh, TV channels, which could also play a disproportionate role, even if they don't win. Uh, and the other question is about the outsiders, Zelensky and Vakarchuk. Uh, Zelensky in particular seems to poll better than a lot of the traditional candidates, but is it too late? Do they have a financial organization or a political organization sort of hiding in the, in the background in case they, they, they jump in in the next two weeks, or is it, is it too late for the outsiders? Why don't, why don't we take that? That's a pretty meaty question to ask, and I think some of you touched on some of the issues of candidates jumping in and not maybe having the resources or immediate access to do so. So um, I don't know if Steve or Kiev, if you want to jump in, and obviously Brussels, please do as well. Uh, Irina, would you like to comment on this question? Okay. Uh, as for TV channels, it is obviously now uh, that pro-Russian politics and pro-Russian uh, owners uh, are, uh, first of all, uh, News 1, uh, 112, and maybe Inter. I am not sure about Inter, but at least these two channels uh, mm, are now under Medvedchuk, and uh, they conduct pro -Russian, cl very clear pro-Russian politics. That's true. Uh, as for uh, Vakarchuk and uh, Zelensky, it is clear that he is supported uh, f by fund uh, by Kolomoisky. And, uh, oh, sorry. Zelensky, Zelensky. Yes, Zelensky. Zelensky is funded by Kolomoisky, his, his son. Uh, he supported him as an artist, and now uh, he supported uh, uh, his so-called party. They um, registered party Sluga Narodu, uh, the servant of people. Uh, it was a spectator, it was a TV, and now this is the name of party. First, it was a TV film, and now it is the name of party. 
of course there is no any part there is uh, no party but uh, the name it is and in survey it is um, it uh, collected it collects about uh, uh, five uh, six percent and is enough to, uh, for this so-called political party to be in f the future parliament. I don't think that uh, Zelensky will be at the second round at elections, but it is obvious that at least he could to be at the future parliament, people of Kolomoisky. Uh, as for Vokarchuk, it is not clear whether he will participate at elections. We don't know anything about this. And of course, we don't know about his, uh, his financial supporters now. Back to Washington now. I don't know if uh, Brussels or if Steve, if you wanted to comment on. Well, again, it's very unclear. I, I've given up trying to, uh, to make predictions about this particular election. So uh, no clear idea whether these two will enter the elections and uh, not very clear how well they would do uh, if they entered the elections at, at this late stage in the game. Uh, and no clear picture about whether either have uh, the political structures and financial structures in place to mount an effective national campaign. Just unclear. Spilana, I, yeah. Yeah. So I, I from our our view is is uh, I think as we are unclear whether they especially Bakarchuk will enter or not I think he probably himself is not clear so just the reflection of his own uncertainty and uh, is is probably we we quite consistent on that front probably with him He's, he doesn't know probably himself this is my assumption is. I think regarding Zelensky, it's an interesting phenomenon, but we can also see there is a certain percentage of those who are undecided and there's a certain percentage of those who are sick of everybody on the list. And, and, and in a way for them, Zelensky may also represent that um, way of showing protest uh, vote with everybody else. Um, I think, of course, he has a name recognition. He is popular. He, he's had his show for ages. And I think that... Um, uh, Actors and, and uh, comedians and reality TV show hosts are not the first ones only in Ukraine to win, um, to, to gain uh, voting votes. Um, so we, it's, it's someone to reckon with and to be to to, be, to watch with. Uh, I think that it's hard to know exact relationship probably with Kolomoisky, but I would also assume that with uh, high recognition, um, Kolomoisky would also be wanting to keep Zelensky on his side because uh, Zelensky could also work on probably other, other channels. But this is just, you know, just personal assumption. Uh, so we will have to see and, and watch how that, um, how that pair develops. Well, I, I hope that when we talk about actors, we're talking more about uh, Reagan. Uh, yeah. Type actors, uh, <laughs> in Brussels, the we're watching the U.S. scene as well. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's so. It certainly, certainly begs begs the question: Ukraine, which candidate isn't uh, connected or being funded by uh, oligarchs or connected to oligarchs? Um, let me do this. I want to open it up um, to others who may have questions here. So please raise your hand. Uh, if you do, okay. And we have one over here. Hold. Thank you. Hi, I'm Asul Panchova with USAID. Just a quick uh, question to any of the panelists in case you have comments regarding two trends that surround elections anywhere in the world, uh, and I'm sure in Ukraine too. One is cybersecurity. How prepared do you think the CEC and other actors are to handle any expected attacks? And the second one is disinformation, and not just as, uh, in regards to TV, but social media as well. Uh, how active and capable is civil society and others to deal with uh, the trends of disinformation? Um, that's a good question on cybersecurity and then disinformation. And I think there's in, uh, di Russian disinformation and then there's internal disinformation as well. Um, the last task force meeting we did uh, did focus on cybersecurity, but I would welcome comments from uh, both Kiev and Brussels here in Washington on sort of efforts to address those challenges. And uh, Elena, I know you and RPR have been quite outspoken about the need to address this challenge. So maybe I'll turn it first to Kiev. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the Central Election Commission has been reshuffled very recently, only in September this year. This happened four years later than this should have happened. So unfortunately, the CEC is uh, short on time to to, to be well prepared for the elections, I would say. And um, it is working closely with international organizations, primarily with IFAS and uh, other organizations to, to make Ukraine prepared in this short term, term uh, until the presidential elections and um, during the year we have for the, until the parliamentary elections. So uh, to be short and to be brief, I would not say that Ukraine is uh, ready to face cybersecurity threats and risks that are anticipated, but we hope and believe that with the international support that CEC has and with the civil society experts helping CEC, it will be able to, mm, to, to, to face most of the cybersecurity threats that are anticipated. Uh, well, that's that's the one topic we, we didn't address previously, and that is uh, what attempts will Russia make uh, and, and their ongoing attempts to uh, sow confusion, to sow uh, uh, a sense of, of disunity in advance of the elections, of the cyber threat. Uh, let me just share, we, we have met um, privately with some of the big players in the social media sphere. Don't want to get into who, but... There's a general consensus among them, and, and some of them are very active in Ukraine, that uh, Russia will utilize the Ukrainian presidential and parliamentary elections as a platform to try out certain techniques that might be employed in the United States in our next national election in 2020. So there's a sense from the experts in the field that Ukraine might be a proving ground for these types of techniques. Uh, so I, I know that IFAS and others are working hard in this field. I know that there are several uh, social media uh, actors, very active uh, leaders in the field that are working with the Ukrainian authorities in the hopes that we can prevent the sense of disinformation during the campaign period to again sow discontent, to plant falsehoods, to plant lies about this candidate, that candidate, to promote the pro-Russia cause, pro-Russia candidates, and then ultimately, I mean, the worst case scenario, of cyber attacks on whether it's Ukraine's banking system, uh, its financial systems, ultimately uh, the central election database on election data. These are all threats that I think the Ukraine has to consider, take into consideration as it approaches these elections. So our hope is that Ukraine will be prepared, but I think, I think we have to be prepared for a number of different scenarios and a variety of Russian threats in this realm. And, and I just want to remind um, everyone that uh, the last meeting of the task force focused on cybersecurity. Uh, so we also have a there's a, a great uh, piece written by Adrian, who's uh, one of the leaders of this effort. Um, so we're happy to share that. We also had IFAS participated, uh, pointing out a number of the, the key challenges and needs for the government to address prior to the elections. And uh, although I think there's a great deal of recognition regarding the challenge, there's obviously um, there's areas and gaps uh, in terms of what needs to be addressed before the election and on election day. And so I think it deserves uh, a great deal of attention and support, both from international partners, working with civil society, but also working with the Ukrainian government. Um, Svetlana, I just wanted from from uh, from your perch to an EED and uh, what you're seeing on this issue, um, both concerns about cybersecurity, but also this issue of disinformation and addressing it in civil society's role in addressing it in this uh, pre-election and election period. Well, I think that we've touched on the issue of um, uh, societal distrust to, to government institutions, to authorities, and this is something that you know, has been in Ukraine historically for different reasons, why there is a distrust to authorities. But it can also be a little bit of a, of a protection mechanism to, to, to treat different information with skepticism uh, that is both set from official and unofficial channels, but it can also be used against them. But this is something to put it out there. I think in general we are a bit concerned sometimes of the issues that can be quite divisive and also of the groups which may be even placing themselves as a highly nationalist or far right, but actually they are, you know, with some speculations are supported by all sorts of potentially actors and may not be that one 
acting out of this um, uh, ideological genuine platform that they proclaim to be. So this is also something that you know you can you can watch carefully in the civil society <coughs> reels, uh, uh, genuine, but also the fake uh, groups and and fake NGOs who who just stir up the the, the societal. Uh, mood uh, that, that is more divisive. I think the idea of elections and divisive message um, has been there for some time. It's not new. Even with uh, with Yanukovych's campaign, we all very well remember that the campaign was very uh, placed on divisions. I think with the social media, uh, and this is challenge as already was um, mentioned, I think that is not applicable just to Ukraine, is that we do have eco chambers which reinforce messages in the communities that amplify that particular points of view. And this is also uh, uh, the case uh, can be for, for, for Ukraine and in a country which is suffering and in a place of war, this, all of these challenges um, are, are there. So that's concerning the, the, the societal mood and something uh, we are watching on. On cybersecurity, I think I'm not probably as uh, aware uh, of that issues so in, in depth to, to, to provide comment on as such. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bruno, I want to send it over to you uh, for questions in, in Brussels. Sure. Uh, we do have a few people here that want to chip in, so perhaps I suggest that we take the questions together in one round. Uh, please introduce yourself, and if it is a question, perhaps you can clarify whether you want Kiev to answer or Washington to answer or both. So, here it is, gentlemen, okay. and then uh, you, Mark. Thank you. So, yeah, that's my original Georgia at this. At this point, I'm working with Madam Anna Potiga, the European Parliament, Security Defense Subcommittee. My question is quick. Ambassador uh, Vershko mentioned some potential uh, surprises from the Russian side, uh, specifically deploying some fighter jets in Crimea. Would there be any thoughts that either from Washington or, um, or both uh, from Kiev could provide some thoughts? Can he speak into the microphone? Uh, 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 I, I can only hear the echo of... Uh, ...special attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me just take this question and go perhaps to Marta now for another comment. Uh, Marta Baron, the organization Promote Ukraine. I have a question to Irina Vatishkina. Uh, from those 17% uh, undecided, did you ask them uh, for whom they definitely will not vote? Has this question been raised? Anyone else in person? Okay, so I don't know if you all... Can, can they speak into the microphones? A potential military aid or military role? Uh, military potential escalation or surprises from Russia. Okay, escalation or surprises by Russia in Ukraine. What's the thoughts on that in DC or in, in Kiev as well? And then the last question was, whether we know or not know if there are people that, that the voters would not uh, vote on, and that question was that was aimed or actually addressed for, for Kiev. So that's it here in Brussels. Over to you. Kiev, do you want to answer some of those questions uh, first, and then we're gonna, we can weigh in, I think, uh, on the Washington side. Uh, yes, Jonathan, we would like to answer the second question. Irina, please. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly those uh, who uh, say difficult to say, uh, they answer the same in the uh, question not to vote. Uh, but uh, if to compare candidates uh, on the second place after uh, difficult to say is Poroshenko. First difficult to say, second Poroshenko and partly other candidates. Uh, was it clear enough, or do you need any clarification on our side? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. I think I, if I if I could just on 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 the security situation, and I think it's been raised here, um, and I'm happy also, um, you know, with Ambassador Birschbau here as well too. Um, obviously, there's a great deal of attention in Washington now. Uh, both looking, you know, uh, from externally from the outside, people urging the administration uh, to do mo do more to address the security situation, um, and I think that's what you're alluding to um, in the Black Sea and support for Ukraine, whether it's providing additional defensive weapons, or if it's looking at sort of the role of NATO and expanding the role of NATO, or looking at uh, enhanced sanctions. 
Uh, there's a number of sanctioned vehicles already in Congress right now um, that would look to do that. I think there's a great deal of interest. Elena pointed out uh, with resolutions that have been introduced uh, to uh, to actually to respond in a more uh, demonstrative way to what took place. And I think for some, there's some concern that the current administration right now is not uh, moving quickly enough or in a, a strong enough way to address what took place. Um, I'm not privy right now to the internal discussions within the administration. Uh, there's a lot of distracting issues because we're at the end of a of a end of a Congress, a change in, in leadership in the in the House, and a and a budget situation uh, that could lead to a government shutdown. I haven't seen the latest this morning uh, in, in in Washington. Uh, so uh, I think there's a lot of discussion about that, um, and I think what you you're seeing. Uh, Elena, which she mentioned as well earlier, there's a great deal of bipartisan support uh, for, um, for for additional sanctions, uh, but also enforcement of existing sanctions uh, that are in place. And I think, from my perspective, the most important part is coordinating this with our allies in, in Brussels as well. We understand there's some different approaches to the issue of sanctions uh, in Brussels. You know better than anybody else. Uh, the different factors and different country perspectives on this issue. Um, and uh, obviously the UN General Assembly of vote. Uh, it was quite interesting to see who were the lead sponsors of that resolution uh, in Europe uh, and who amongst NATO allies was not a lead sponsor um, of that resolution, which highlights, I think, uh, the relationships um, that Russia has been able to exploit uh, internally in Europe, which includes, I think, Budapest, uh, a relationship with Viktor Orban or the government in Italy. Uh, we know that there's uh, a lot of challenges internally within the EU. Uh, but Ambassador Vershbaugh, would you want to weigh in in any way? We'd like to get your comment. Do we have a... yeah, very briefly, uh, I, I don't have in, any inside information yet, but it seems that uh, so far neither the, the US nor the EU nor NATO, for that matter, are really doing anything concrete. Uh, to impose costs on the Russians for the November 25 event, and that's a source of some uh, chagrin uh, because uh, there's a lot of echoes of what Russia did in Georgia in 2008 in terms of incremental provocations in the course of the spring and the summer, none of which were seen as big enough to warrant a response, but suddenly kind of laid the trap for Saakashvili that led to the Georgia war, and the danger is the same. Uh, inadvertent green light may be being flashed at Putin, particularly since we know that they're going to try to destabilize the situation in some way during the elections, whether it's just through propaganda and social media manipulation or whether they'll stage <coughs> an actual military provocation, uh, whether it's you know, a card or two Crimea or something more limited. Uh, and uh, you know, Deterring this is, I think, what the West needs to do and get its act together sooner rather than later. Kurt Volker has been leaning forward in his public statements, which is often the case, and maybe he is aware that there is deliberations going on, but my sense is that uh, uh, beyond demanding the return of the ships and the sailors uh, without any or else attached to that, uh, the inclination in both Washington and Brussels is to... Uh, uh, wait and see and not really do anything. So that, that I think is, is dangerous uh, given past patterns of behavior by Putin. Uh, we also, uh, also like uh, Ambassador Bill Taylor is here as so well. I wanted to weigh in on this on this question in this issue. Thanks, Jonathan. I agree with Sandy um, that not in, that we haven't taken strong measures. We've said some things. Um, I understand, however, that there are considerations, there are thoughts, there are um, deliberations within the government um, on a set of issues. One in particular has to do with Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2. Um, and we have the authority to take some actions that would stop Nord Stream 2. Um, this would be one that would be well coordinated, should be coordinated with, uh, with the Europeans, um, but that there's not total agreement within the administration on this yet. There's there, there are strong views in favor of taking some action, strong actions against Nord Stream um, needs to be finalized. Uh, but so, so, but I agree with Sandy, this is what needs to do. Actions, not just words on this. 
Uh, thank you. And I, I think there's a, a lot of agreement, too, um, in sort of the approach on Nord Stream 2. I, uh, I thought the president, um, <laughs> well, I think the uh, President Trump on this was, was quite clear about where his position was and then, um, and then sometimes makes it a little bit less clear. But hopefully the administration going into the new year will, will step up to address that issue because I think we're, we're hitting some breaking points on it where, um, where that issue will uh, move forward in a way that won't be uh, constructive for security in the region and for Ukraine. Uh, if I could, uh, just uh, Bruno and, and Brussels too, is there any other comments? Do you want to, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on this, uh, or others did, but is there any other questions in Brussels? Well, I, just briefly from my side, Jonathan, you know, the sanctions here, of course, have a lot of attention. I am not so concerned about uh, the continuity of ex existing sanctions. I think those are there to stay. But I am more concerned about introducing new ones. There, I think that the challenge will be very significant, and I am and I am unsure that the EU could follow the United States in introducing new measures in this regard. So I think the existing ones we shouldn't be too concerned, but new ones that would be a challenge. I don't think that around the table, and I'm looking around, there are more comments or questions, but. Um, I would definitely like to uh, perhaps give the word as well to Svetlana, uh, who has views on this too. Yeah, I think in general, what you know, the developments in 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 the EU also feed into what's happening in in Ukraine, and what's happening in Ukraine also influences prob probably the reading of, of of Russia and the situation, you know, the, what, what they're doing in Ukraine. I think in general, when it comes to Russia, it has greatly misread the situation in Ukraine, perhaps because the assumption was that they know it very well, um, but you know, it comes to it that it didn't. Um, so making assumptions like that uh, can be misleading. That's concerning the, the past actions. But now I think there are some issues which are uh, maybe perceived as kind of non-rational and, per and personalized, and one of them may be church. Um, and I think for, for Ukraine, this is a very historical uh, milestone. A lot of people who have been standing um, for, for hours in the street uh, on Saturday waiting for, for, for how things will develop. But I think at the same time for Russia, this is also interpreted in a different way and, and quite personalized, and including not just for, for the ruling elite, but also you know, there are different views in the society. And I think that in this, um, with this issue, we also have to be watch things closely, how uh, reaction will be and what will influence will be um, of, of Russia within the internal situation in Ukraine by different means. Um, because in democratic societies, it's also very easy to destabilize things, even internal, internally speaking. So this is a, a vulnerable time to watch. On the other hand, the situation that we see here in the EU is also not as strong for, that maybe can influence the reading from Russia. We have a you know, protests, including in Brussels, but in France, which weakens the position of President Macron. We have uh, new elections, uh, new change of leadership also in Germany coming up. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the things that are changing are also changing the dynamic that we'll be uh, having around the table of, of EU member states. And this is also may indirectly influence the developments uh, in Russia's calculation, something for us to, to watch. So, Jonathan, I think uh, this is... Uh more or less it here from Brussels for, for, for now. So over to you. Thank, thank you. And I, I appreciate you sort of laying out also sort of the different different factors within Europe that sometimes uh, so important for uh, Washington to better understand. Also for Kiev, as well as you calculate as Ukrainian government officials, civil society are, are sort of looking at the next year ahead of what, what could change and how best to communicate. This is truly a transatlantic uh, project. So Svetlana, thank you um, uh, again. And I just want to just check here, was anybody here, any last questions from US side? Okay, well, I see that we're actually running up against our, our, our timing. And uh, first and foremost, want to thank everybody for participating. Um, you know, we always say that, you know, beyond just the task force events, task force events where uh, people are available to to engage and speak. I know, Elena, um, that you as well, um, and I'll, I'll send it over to you for final word. Um, but we really appreciate, again, everybody's uh, role in participating. This is about uh, conversation, about information sharing. Um, and I think based on the discussion today, you, you understand how complex this 
situation is also uh, tenuous given all the challenges in the region. And I think I think it's fair to say that Ukraine is going to be for the United States, for Europe, a top foreign policy <laughs> issue in 2019. Um, all eyes are on uh, what's taking place in Kiev. And so we appreciate the role of civil society um, and the work that you are all doing on the ground and very much focused on that. Your work also with the government uh, to move Ukraine forward. Um, so I'm going to send the, the last word over, Orlando, to you. We will, you know, we'll talk about some of the future. Well, obviously, when we come back in January, we'll, we'll re, uh, re-engage again um, with, uh, with the task force, uh, mainly uh, to you and to also to Bruno, to everyone in Brussels as well. Thank you. And, and also, happy holidays to everybody. Um, and I appreciate a week before the holidays, uh, less, than, less than a week, that everyone showed up um, to participate. And I think it highlights uh, both here in Washington, Brussels, and also in Kiev, um, sort of the interest in, in all the issues that we discuss. So, Elena, back over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. And I would like to reiterate our gratitude to the Western partners for uh, your continuous assistance to Ukraine and to request your further support in ensuring a fair, open and um, transparent elections in Ukraine. And to reiterate what Irina Bekeshkina said, the key support uh, may come in uh, in helping Ukraine to conduct uh, independent exit polls, um, also in supporting the NGOs that work uh, with the electoral uh, topics, with the electoral reform and also um, the help may come in helping Ukraine to hold uh, open um, and transparent debates between all the candidates and ensuring the access to the media to those candidates. Um, as Jonathan said, uh, we will be closely monitoring the developments around the martial law and um, like I said before, um, from what we know now, um, it should end on December 26th and as President said two days ago, it will not be extended unless uh, uh, full-fledged Russian invasion happens, which we very much hope will not be the case. Uh, we will continue holding this uh, teleconferences on a regular basis, and um, we are welcome to your comments and questions, and we encourage you to participate and to send any of your inquiries and questions to us uh, between the teleconferences. Uh, please stay in touch. Uh, thank you very much again, and happy holidays, everyone. Elena, thank you. And also, just if I could just, again, thank all of our speakers today. And just uh, Steve Nix had a run. He's actually going up to the Hill to uh, talk to people about this exact issue. Um, but I just want to, if everybody could just join me in, in thanking all of our, our speakers. Just... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.